Are you working on your author career, but struggling to get that first book published? Does the goal of being an author seem too lofty? Or are thoughts of having multiple books and making a full-time living are as fantastical as living in Cinderella's castle? Welcome to Discovered Wordsmiths, a podcast where aspiring authors can be heard. Join Steven Schneider as he finds and talks to authors you may not know, but authors that have gotten their foot on the author career path. Hear what they've done to get there and where they want to go now. Settle back. It's time for a bit of inspiration and advice. Come listen to today's Discovered Wordsmith. Brought to you by Mind Architecture. Building worlds for your mind. Today on Discover Wordsmiths, I have Colin uh, Leonard. How are you doing today, sir? I'm great. Thanks very much. Oh, please. No, <laughs> I, my book was just released yesterday and we had a launch party the day before. So I'm. this is a timely interview as well. I'm all oh. about the book at the moment. Nice. Awesome. All right. It's a launch party. Congrats. Was it fun? Yeah, no, it was great. It was Bridgescape Press, my publisher organized it and we had a good few people online and yeah just had a great time and nice chat about folk horror nice and that's the book country roads which we're going to talk about in a few minutes but before we get to the book tell us a little bit about yourself where you live and some of the things you like to do besides writing cool so i live in county mead in ireland in a little rural um, it's not even a village. It's uh, in a little tiny cottage with a, a scrap of land that keeps me busy when I'm not writing, repairing the house and uh, trying to keep the the field from growing too wild. <laughs> uh, apart from that, I have a young family, so the rest of my time is taken up with their activities, which they are big into sports and music. So. We get to bring them here and there, watch their matches and watch their performances. So nice. that's, yeah, it's a lovely age that they are at the moment. Or, uh, what do they play? Two of them play piano, one plays violin, and they play soccer and cricket as well. Wow, so. nice. Yeah, I had piano lessons when I was young and still play music. So it's a oh, great cool. thing uh, for kids. Yeah, definitely approve. <laughs> Yeah, no, it is. It is fantastic to do it. So let me ask, with a family and everything, why did you want to start writing and why did you want to write horror? I've always been writing on and off. From when I was a kid, I was always encouraged by my parents and my school teachers. My, we were made aware all the time that my grandfather was a poet. He had stuff published in the national newspapers. So he was a, a farmer and a truck driver as well, but he took the time to to write poetry. Then leading into secondary school, I continued writing genre type stuff and entering it into competitions, some of which I won and got into the school magazine and that kind of thing. But life takes you in different places. Even though I did English literature in college, I didn't end up working in that. I did different things, traveled different places. But once my life became more settled and I got a bit older, um, I became more focused on trying to get published and concentrating on learning my craft a bit more and giving a bit more time to writing. Nice, nice. Okay, so your book is called Country Roads and it's folk horror. Tell us a little bit about the book. So. It's, as you say, it's called Country Roads and it's set in rural Ireland in somewhere similar to where I live and to where I grew up. It's about a guy called Luke Sheridan who moves to this place from the city with his wife and his baby. And he does that kind of at the behest of his old college buddy, Declan Maguire, who's a local Garda. But it just so happens around this time, there's a series of brutal murders in the area and <laughs> but it's coming from a supernatural element there are some horrible creatures from irish folklore that are creeping back into our domain i i love that and i love my my son has a book 
with Irish ghost stories he picked up when he was over there. And, and I'm imagining that you don't read this book to your kids. Oh, it's set right here by us and it's got <laughs> monsters. Let's read it for bed. <laughs> no, I did get a congratulations from one of my daughters and she said, I can't wait till I'm old enough to read it. <laughs> and then it'll be on you, kid, not me. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You remember that field you were in? Let me tell you about the monster I wrote about in that field. Yeah, yeah. nightmares galore. Your wife will love you. You'll be on the couch forever. <laughs> And all this was true. <laughs> <laughs> Based on true events. <laughs> yeah. So why did you choose a horror genre to write horror, specifically? Ireland is very kind of spooky, I think. There is just the weight of religion and that kind of Gothic Catholicism around. And then there's that mixed in with the the sense of folklore and myth, things like the Banshee and all that. So that was always around me. And then I grew up watching things like Critters and Gremlins and The Omen and all that. So, but as well, I think so much more writing than that than gets labeled horror is horror. I see horror as nearly anything that's a bit off, that's in a minor key, the kind of music that appeals to me TV shows and all that, that mightn't just be labeled horror, but I think they have a horror element. If you think of things like musically, Radiohead, the Pixies, all that, just a little bit off. And I agree, especially for movies, music is huge, but horror is just so broad that yeah. you can have multiple types of stories within horror. And it's easy to get horror elements in lots of other types of stories if you're not straight horror, too. That's a benefit. Yeah, exactly. And even there's so many different types, whether it's slasher or ghost stories or, but yeah, no, apart from that, I just like giving myself a good fright. <laughs> good. And I like that you've used elements from Ireland because Ireland's got a great history of supernatural folk stories and things you've got a lot to draw on from the country yeah absolutely i try and base most of my work in ireland just apart from right what i just i feel there's so much here to explore in right. in that spooky sense agreed agreed what type of feedback are you getting from readers other than your kids no, they, everyone seems to like it so far. Of the ones that I'm reading, I'm not going to read the bad ones. <laughs> but they're focusing a lot on the fact that it's a small town horror with unlikable characters, a creep, creepy imagery. And it's funny, I wouldn't have described it as small town horror so much because our small towns over here are much smaller than American small towns. But it does have that sense of a community and how they clash against each other and how, so I've based a lot of things on warring characters against each other as much as against the evil elements in the story. Nice. nice. If you were given a choice between movie or TV show, what would you rather turn this into? I would see this more as a TV show, to tell you the truth. And it's because it's multi POV and I first envisioned it as episodic. Yeah. I see it like uh, those little mini series from Nordic countries or the UK, things like Catla or Requiem, that kind of low budget, grainy, acted, but spooky vibe to it so right. no I'd, I'd see it as a tv series more I, I love that you described it as grainy that that feel of that, that that's a that's a great description i know netflix uses tags and that's a great <laughs> tag that they should put on some horror yeah it fits very well so you mentioned multi point of view that's a lot of times harder to pull off why did you choose to write multi point of view instead of focusing on one character through the whole book yeah i that was just the way I envisioned it. And as well, I would have been reading a lot of stuff that was, that's the kind of thing that was appealing to me at the same time. So all the different characters popped into my head and I just didn't want to stick with one. I wanted to, to pop in and out of the others. And also some of the characters whose POV you're in die. <laughs> so I wanted to 
have the reader a little bit on edge that he's not quite they're not quite sure whether the the head that they're in is going to be attached to the body by the end of the chapter and it does help bring people in closer to the characters like you said uh, that slasher feel almost where you you empathize with each character and then they start getting knocked off <laughs> <It makes> you, <laughs> yeah. who's next oh man don't let so and so be next <laughs> yeah as long as it's not hey he killed my favorite character <laughs> and throw the book aside i'm done with that <laughs> so colin do you have a website that people could go to and check out your book I do indeed. I'm at collyleonard.com. That's C-O-L-Y-L-E-O-N-A-R-D.com. Why uh, Colly? Colinleonard.com was taken up a <laughs> long time ago by other people. I was one of the, do you remember when we had to get invited to get a Gmail address? I'm of that vintage. So Colin Leonard was gone, but Colly Leonard was still there. And since then, everyone has started calling me Collie as well. But... Nice. Okay. I love that. So do you have any plans for uh, the next book? I've written a few. I've written a couple of novellas that I'm polishing up, and I have completed another novel. And I'm hoping to start sending that out soon once I complete edits on it. It's, this one's a really tight, single point of view, just to go completely the other way and it's it's set in a city as opposed to the countryside okay but it's still horror it's still oh yeah absolutely it's still horror <laughs> nice. I, I love horror it's my favorite genre myself i sometimes don't read enough of it anymore but it is my favorite so let me ask you a couple other questions uh, about mm -hmm. where you live in that so growing up or as an adult what are some of your favorite books and authors that you've read so at the moment, my who I'm really into is Nathan Ballingrud. I think he's just amazing. He did he became the TV series Monsterland, the North American Lake Monsters is his okay. collection of short stories, and it's mind blowing. I think he's the best writer working in the genre at the moment. Apart from that, there's another an English writer called Tom Fletcher, who has a story called Witch Bottle or a novel called Witch Bottle, and it's very much in that folk horror vein as well. And I've read some of his other stuff, and he just writes exactly the sort of thing I'm into. I would read outside of horror as well, people like Emily St. John Mandel, who did Station Eleven. I don't know. I know that, yeah. Yeah. And J.G. Ballard was always uh, someone I've been really into. But yeah, there's tons and tons, but... Most of the writers are readers and have good lists of books to read. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you have a, a favorite bookstore close to you that you like to go to? I don't have any bookstores close to me, depending on how you define close. Right. There's there's one about an hour away called Academy Books in Drogheda that I like to browse in and they support local. Okay, nice. I, I like to put links and maps so if people are going to the website and going to any of these locations where, where we're mentioning books they've got a bookstore to look up and go oh, to and cool. support which i totally push people support bookstores go to bookstores on vacation <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit of author stuff but before we do if somebody stopped you on the street and said hey colin i hear you wrote a book why should i get your book and read it what would you tell them I would say if you want to read something that's set in a creepy Irish setting with a, a feel of wrongness creeping into the contemporary society from ancient evil, then <laughs> give this one a go. Ancient evil. I love that. that. That's one thing. We talked a little bit about folk horror and the rich history of some of the creatures from Ireland. We don't quite have as much of that because the conquerors came and took over America 200 some years ago, wiped everybody else out. So we don't have that long history behind us with the monsters so much. We've got newer ones and we've usurped things like Bigfoot. There's a long history with Native Americans with Sasquatch and Bigfoot, but we, you have to really dig. It's not part of our culture anymore, which I think is a shame. 
other countries like Ireland, you do get that as part of your mythology and culture. We don't have it quite yeah. so much, unfortunately. Exactly. And we a lot of that stuff is passed down through generations. My grandparents would have told us spooky stories and passed them down. And there's really good work, I think, being done here as well by the Folklore Commission, where over the years they've collected handwritten accounts and oral accounts from older generations about little myths and local legends and all that kind of stuff, some of which can be <laughs> quite gory. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's great. I love that. I actually do a horror movie review podcast with a friend and we've watched movies from all over the world. And there, there's some really great ones from Ireland, Scotland, other parts of England, Turkey and various other places. And I love seeing some of the, the difference in how different countries perceive the horror and supernatural. Yeah, no, exactly. There's, there's a bunch of good Irish horror out at the moment. There's a movie called You Are Not My Mother, which uh, is based on the changeling myth as well, which is very scary if you haven't seen that. No, and, I, I, I know the myth. I haven't seen the movie. Yeah, no, it's very grim. That movie it really captures a certain essence of urban Ireland as well. So Nice. I'll have to look that one up. We did watch Grabbers, which was <laughs> set in Ireland. You know that one. I do, yeah. And that's it's funny. Some of Irish horror as well does have that comic element or that absurd element to it as well. I think we go two ways. We either go nasty and absurd or sad and grim <laughs> yeah that one cracked me up obviously i'm not irish at all i've not been to ireland but you got that stereotype americans have stereotypes different countries everybody has a stereotype of people from our countries so what are you going to do if you have aliens invading ireland you find out that they are basically allergic to alcohol and they can't suck your blood, so let's all get drunk at the pub. And it was just that premise was hilarious to me. Yeah, exactly. No, it's very good. <laughs> okay, so there's the book. Let's talk a little author stuff. You mentioned, well, before we get to that, what are some things that you've learned in your writing from when you first started to now that you're doing different or that have changed? One thing is, I know... A lot of people say write every day. You don't have to write every day, but it's as many days as you can. No one's going to discover you if you don't put in the work. And there was a podcast I used to listen to called The Bestseller Experiment, and they were very inspirational where they would talk about just doing a 200 words a day challenge. So even if it's just 20 minutes you can grab here or there, just to keep you writing fit, as it were, because sometimes I would have gone months and months without putting pen to paper. And on that same topic, I, I discovered ways to be able to write all the time. So whereas before I might have needed to be in a particular setting, sitting down with a laptop or whatever, I've learned to write on the run, whether it be in car parks or snatched moments of any day. Okay. And... Do, what do you use to write? Do you use like Word or Scrivener? Or do you have any other tools that you really like? I use, I will do a lot of stuff in the Google verse. So okay. I use Google Docs on a tablet is how I write most of my first drafts and use a note taking app if I'm doing stuff really on the fly. Um, okay. All right. All right. So you mentioned for our discussion for authors about opportunities so what type of opportunities are you talking about? I'm talking about, as I said, no one's going to discover you or come along and find you the way a soccer player might get spotted by a talent scout. So you have to go out and look for opportunities. And what I mean by that is, and what I did later in life is studying the kind of writers that you'd like to be like, the kind of stuff that interests you, the presses that publish the books you're interested in. And then if you look for the open calls, they have the anthologies they put together. And if you try and learn how to format things properly to submit 
all that sorts of stuff. The things to the around the sides of writing that you have to learn if you want to give yourself the best opportunity of being published. And I think a lot of authors still get into this. Not they're new, they've never written, and they get into it thinking, oh. I'll write a book and everyone will love it and I publish it and uh, I'll make a ton of money and quit my day job. And I think in the back of the mind, a lot of authors still think and feel that way, uh, though I don't think it's ever really been that way. <laughs> um, and But then they're almost ashamed to stand on the soapbox and say, hey, take a look at my book. And the opposite or the connected part of that is the opposite the same type of wrongness is the people that stand on their soapbox everywhere and say hey look at me read my book it's hey this is a nascar convention nobody cares about your horror book you know what i'm saying you, you, there's a lot of opportunities but just shouting to the wind everywhere doesn't necessarily prov provide you opportunity exactly yeah you have to focus and like i over the last few years, I really tried to find out as much as possible about the kind of people who are putting out the stuff I like to write. And because if you don't like to write it, what's the point? And just going for things, there's often low, I had a mentorship as well that I applied for about getting your book published. And that was quite local. But if you, if I wasn't looking for that and applying for that, then that taught me how to improve my cover letter and my pitch and all that sorts of stuff. So there's more to it than just sitting down and writing you to give yourself the best chance possible. You have to do that bit of research. And that's interesting as well. It's really interesting to listen to podcasts like the one you're doing here and ones on craft and ones by other publishers just to find out what's going on. And talking with other authors and sometimes authors, it's funny, the same author that will get on Facebook and blast every single group they're in with, hey, read my book, are afraid to go and set up a table at the library for an author event. They don't want to do it in person, but they want to do it anonymously behind. But the, with the way things are, really, if people see you and shake your hand and talk to you, that's how they get to know you, especially in a local community. I know a couple authors that they will, they do one of those, like on a Friday night, different bands come in and set up and they call it rock the lock. Cause it's an old locking lock system for moving barges. Oh, cool. <laughs> and so they, they do rock concerts on Friday night throughout the summer. And I know an author who sets up a table cause you can rent tables and set up for your business and people get to see your face and get to know you. You may not sell a lot, but it's the community getting to know you. And that's, a big thing for authors just getting people to know you and see your face exactly and you learn so much from that and even things like beta reading for other authors and helping out that way is, yes it's invaluable to improving your own craft have you done gotten involved with maybe an open call or some other opportunity that maybe you were hesitant but turned out really well and you were surprised anything like that you've done Oh, yeah. Though I submit to lots of anthologies and I've been lucky enough to get into a few. The Horror Library series by Dark Moon Books. I'm in seven and eight, which was just released now. And if you don't give it a go, you're never going to you're never going to succeed. I used to back when COVID was on and we were all <laughs> sitting around, I used to there was a flash fiction competition for a publisher in the UK and I was determined they had a competition every two weeks and I was determined I was going to get selected by it. So I wrote on the team every couple of weeks, never got in, but each of those stories became the kernel of something else and three or four of them got published in other venues since then. So nice. Yeah. So sometimes you just got to keep trying, take the plunge. I know people get discouraged. They had this writing contest and I entered and I didn't get chosen. Okay. But you understand like 2,500 people entered that and you entered it one time that, yeah. you know, there could be a ton of reasons. It may not have been your writing. It may just have been somebody else had something that just 
caught the fancy of the judges and nailed it. Or maybe you, what you wrote was good, but it was very similar to something that won the week before. So they're doing, so you got to just keep doing it and over and try multiple. Exactly. Things. Yeah. Like the numbers for open calls and competitions are phenomenal, but the more of them, as I say, that's why you have to keep looking out and whether it's through social media or listening to podcasts, you'll find out more places to submit. And the more you do that, the more you learn and the more, the better you'll get as well. Agreed. All right, Colin, I, I appreciate you coming on today, chatting with me. Before we go, do you have any last minute advice for new authors? No, just that. Keep writing, keep reading as well, and read widely. <laughs> Agreed. If you're a horror author, read some romance and, and learn <laughs> some things from it, right? <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for being on, Colin. It was great meeting you. I wish you luck. Thanks so much. You too. Thank you, Stephen. Hi, if you enjoyed this episode of Discovered Wordsmiths, please support the author. Go to their website, go to Amazon, look them up, get the book. And if you click on the link that I have in the show notes, you'll also help support the podcast so I can keep the hosting and all the software I use and uh, keep it running for, to help more authors. When I am recording this, we've got over 100 episodes, lots of authors. Go to the website, discoveredwordsmiths.com. Check it out. There's a lot of great authors, probably in some genre that you love. See what they have. Check out their books. That's what the point of the podcast is for. So people can discover new authors, find some new books they love, support the authors so they can continue writing. So please support them. And if you do like the podcast, if you've been thinking of podcasting or you're a writer, I've got some links also at the website. Click on those if you're interested in any of the software or services that I talk about. Everything that I have there is something I use, so I've got an affiliate link. Again, it's a little bit, if everyone clicked on those, if they were going to get it anyway, it helps keep the podcast going. So let's all help each other out and discover more, so, sorry, discover more, discover more authors to read. Thank you for listening to Discovered Wordsmiths. Come back next week and listen to another author discuss the road they've traveled and maybe sometime in the near future, it might be you.